In this episode of The Fun Waste of Time, we're going to show how our guest took this and turned it into this. Stay tuned. What's up, world? It's the Fun Waste of Time podcast, where a couple of friends get together to discuss all things entertainment, movies, TV, video games, home theater, and anything else considered a fun way to waste your day. I'm your host, Taurus, and co-hosting with me this episode, we've got my good friend, Matt Blair of Brolic Media. I'm not an industry insider. I'm just a fan of my hobbies who enjoys talking shop about my favorite pastimes. So if you enjoy entertainment media, pop culture, and home theater, we hope you enjoy listening into the conversation as much as we're going to have a great time having the discussion. Let's get it started. Welcome to episode 41 of the Fun Waste of Time. And once again, we've got another dedicated home theater experience episode coming your way. We've got a great guest, as you saw in the opening, with a fantastic theater. And we're just going to have a discussion about what he's got going on in his space. He's also done some pretty cool things in his living room that we're going to have a chat about as well. What's going on, Matt? Hey, how's everybody doing? Not bad. Appreciate you taking the time to join us again. Oh, always a pleasure. (laughs) Now, I just want to say, you recently put out a video on your YouTube channel, Brolic Media, that I think a lot of people would be interested in checking out. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? Oh, absolutely. So, um, I recently uploaded the, uh, the video review for the Lumigen Radiance Pro 5348. It is the Iteration of the Lumigen Radiance Pro processor that has dedicated, built, designed and built from the ground up audiophile circuitry that decreases HDMI jitter. And um, I did some A-B testing and took measurements using Room EQ Wizard, and um, the results were superior across the audio. Um, video, personally, I saw differences in the video performance as well, and several people messaged me after uploading the video saying that they saw um, they saw the difference. in the At the end of the video, I didn't say which one was which, but I juxtapose the, the four series against the five series. And several people messaged me saying, I think option X was the five series. So um, yeah, there are definitely differences between the processor and it's not bad versus good. It's outstanding versus outstanding plus one. So yeah, there's really, there's no way to lose whichever one you go with. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely been, um, the, the feedback has been that the video has been helpful so far. That's pretty awesome. And Jeremy, it's kind of funny. I don't know if you've seen the video, but as I was watching it, when he was putting up, comparing what the 5348 was doing as, the, as opposed to the regular Radiance Pro, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, man, this just kind of feels like taking a college course or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, Matt. All right, guys. If you haven't done so just yet, go subscribe to Matt's YouTube channel, Brolic Media. If you're into home theater, you do not want to miss the awesome content He regularly shares on his channel. Some really good stuff going on there. Our guest today is someone who's pretty active within the home theater community. I've seen some of his posts in various home theater Facebook groups and on AVS Forum. Now, for those who aren't in the know, AVS Forum is one of the premier home theater discussion forums. I'm a big fan of what he's done with and how he uses his home theater. We were corresponding back and forth a while ago, and I thought it would be fun to have him join us on the show to talk about his phenomenal theater. Let's give a warm welcome and round of applause to Jeremy Pyle. Thank you. (laughs) Happy to be here. What is going on, Jeremy? Not much, not much. Yeah, really excited to to kind of break all this down and and, uh, share some some of the things I've done and some of the lessons learned and so on. I want to thank you for taking the time to join us on the show, and it is absolutely awesome to have you on. Now, 
For those of you who aren't familiar with what we do here at The Fun Waste of Time, and this may be your first time watching or listening to us, we're a show that's for fans by fans of our favorite hobbies and pastimes. And just like at the barbershop or around the water cooler, as they say, when you get a bunch of like-minded people together talking about their favorite hobbies and some of the things that they're into, it can make for fun, interesting conversations, and most importantly, a good time. The pillars of our show are movies, TV, video games, and home theater. While we're not opposed to hanging out and talking with industry insiders and professionals, and have done that a time or two, particularly on the home theater side, we're all about the fan and enthusiast experience. We believe in connecting with the fans and enthusiasts of these awesome hobbies and these hobby communities. Now, with that said, if you like to have a good time and are into any of those hobbies that I just discussed, and you want to join us on the show to talk shop with us, shoot us an email at podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. We're always interested in meeting new people and making new friends who enjoy these hobbies as much as we do. Now, since this is a home theater experience episode, if you have a home theater or media room you'd like to share and talk about with people who can appreciate what you've done or plan to do in your space, reach out to us. We absolutely love having folks on the show who are like us, just regular fans talking about their home theaters. All types of spaces are welcome, whether it's budget, high-end, or somewhere in between. There are all types of home theaters out there, and I guarantee you, you'll be helping someone who's asking the same questions and having a near experience to what you did as you were setting up your space. If you're interested and want to join us, email us at podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. Once again, that's podcast at thefunwasteoftime, all one word. Shoot us a few photos of what you're working with, and we will absolutely get back to you. All right. Well, let's not delay. Let's get into home theater experience. TV, movies, video games, the ultimate home theater experience. experience. HTX. X, X, X. Home theater experience is for those listeners who have or who aspire to have a home theater. Whether it's a dedicated home theater that's light controlled, with a projector, projection screen, and an immersive sound system, or those who have a nice media room with a large TV and a great surround sound system to complement the viewing experience. In this segment, I typically like to highlight my experience watching movies and TV shows, as well as playing video games in the fun waste of time theater and game room. I also give my opinion on whether or not I feel that content is worthy enough to recommend to you for you to experience it in your own theater or media room. I'm also a big proponent of featuring home theaters of fans and enthusiasts within our home theater community who are open to sharing their space and discussing some of the things they've done as well as how their space is used. And that is what we're doing today. Before we get started, there's a question all guests on the show have to answer first, though. So, Jeremy, this first question is for you. I'm going to turn it over to Matt now. Matt, take it away. Jeremy, as you know, the name of this show is The Fun Waste of Time, which is all about celebrating our hobbies. So, in the spirit of that, I want to know, what are the fun ways you like to waste your day? Meaning, what are your hobbies? Yeah, so um, I'm a computer engineer by, by trade and a, a development manager at a technical computing company. So I think that founds kind of the whole the whole technology hobby, you know, home theater, video games, computers, devices, all that sort of stuff. I'm I'm a consummate tinkerer and an early adopter. So I'm always moving something, you know, um, hooking something up, buying something to try it out, burning my wife out on all my mm -hmm. um, changes and and uh, and so on. But so that that's definitely up there. Other things that I really enjoy, um, I love the gym. I make it to the gym, you know, at least try to get five days a week. Um, comics, uh, avid comic reader, finance, as well as another personal hobby. I love um, investing, you know, podcasts, uh, anything related to like long-term investing for finance. And I'm starting to learn about the crypto market a little as well. 
I got to tell you, I think you'd fit right in with us talking about comics and, and TV shows and everything else that you're into. That's awesome to hear. Fantastic. So let's talk about your theater now, Jeremy. Sure. And I'd like to discuss the design and components that you have in your theater. So everyone has an idea of what you're working with. Right. And some of the things that I'd like to touch on are your room dimensions, the width, length, and ceiling height. Do you have any windows in your theater? Screen, type, size, and manufacturer, projector, brand and model, speaker layout, configuration, brand and placement, seats, the type of seats you have, how many, do you have any roles, uh, and what's the distance from the screen to the seats? Do you have any bass transducers? Where's your captain's chair? Acoustical choices, your panels, do you have any diffusers? Your door, is it a solid core door or is it just a standard door? And then any devices that you have in your theater, media player, uh, Blu-ray player, streaming devices, home theater PC, gaming systems, video processor. And before you dig into all of that, though, I want to show a 30-second video of your space, and then we'll let you take over to talk about what it is you have. Perfect. So what we're doing right now is we're watching a video of Jeremy's theater as you walk into the room, and then we get the opportunity to see all of the glorious and fantastic things he has going on in here. I love all the panels that you have going on in there, but the sound is really tight and crisp. Yeah, those, those do a lot for the room, for sure. The curtains and the skirt that you have going along the bottom of the, the room there is a really cool idea. I definitely want to hear more about that. He's rocking that kaleidoscape, Matt. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> I see. Yeah, the folk house, oh, those speakers are beautiful. That is awesome. All right. So I just wanted to take a second to go over the room since you sent us some video, and I'm glad you did. Now, I want you to take a moment to tell us a little bit about the room, discussing some of the things that I just mentioned a little earlier. Yep, absolutely. So dimension-wise, uh, it's 18 by 16 by 11. Um, 18 feet's the, the throw distance dimension. Uh, so 16 wide, 11 high. We, it's in our basement. When we built the house, we did a double, uh, double block layer on top of the poured wall. So we ended up with just shy of 11 feet ceilings um, in the basement there. Um, in terms of the equipment, the screens, a Stewart uh, SEMA, uh, SEMA Neve, uh, 135 inch, 16.9 fixed frame. Um, I just went white. I did a lot of research going in and I knew I was going to have a light controlled space. And so dealing with gray and ambient rejection, all that stuff didn't, didn't seem to really matter. Bone white and a, and a decent little gain um, was definitely the winner winner for the room thought about going 150 as well but i'm kind of glad i stuck with the 135 i think 150 would have would have pushed the speakers out a little bit too much and maybe been a little little too overbearing uh projectors a jvc nx7 um actually when i when i first put the room together i had an x790 in there but then they dropped the nx series and the native 4k so i i quickly upgraded to that as quick as i could get my hands on one uh speaker layout uh, like Matt noted, the, the focals are in there. It's 7.2.4 um, with some mixed focal speakers. So I have uh, 1038 BEs for the towers, and then they're um, 1008 center. And then I went with the ARIA series for the surrounds and the heights. Um, so specifically the ARIA 906. So same four speakers for the surround layer, same four speakers for the height layer. I ended up going with heights instead of directly on the ceiling for Atmos because I think we'll get into it a little bit more as we go. But one of the main challenges I had for the room was I didn't want to tear anything up. I converted a room. We'll talk more about that, I think, coming up. But getting things in wall, in ceiling, or mounting speakers and such, I kind of I was constrained a little bit in that sense. So I just stuck with the heights instead of trying to go directly up. But that was nice because it gave me the same eight speakers, right, in those eight positions. Um, and then the subs are a couple of REL uh, S5 SHO series. 
So it definitely works for the room. Um, and I, I love the performance out of the folk house. I did a lot of research leading up to getting those. Um, the thing that kind of drove me to Focal was the fact that they make their own speakers and they make their own drivers. And that BE series is the beryllium tweeters. And I was able to grab them just as that model was being discontinued. So it's a pretty, pretty hefty pair of uh, towers, but got them at a nice significant discount, making it pretty, making it, making it viable um, to, to grab those. Um, in terms of the seating, um, I didn't do I didn't do caption shares. I didn't do home theater seating. I knew kind of going in that I wanted to make sure to have some dead space behind the seating so that I could have the surround speakers, the back surrounds kind of properly, properly positioned and not, you know, right, right over top of the back of your head. So I wanted that I wanted that row, right, a good four feet or so off of that back wall. And then thinking about, you know, how we would use it. I've got a family of four and my wife and two kids. Um, and kind of expecting that maybe we would get one more similarly sized family in there at most. Um, I went wider on the seating and we went for the couch specifically because you can get more bodies on the couch and you can kind of cozy up. So that's, it's just actually an Ikea couch, a Kivik series sectional with the two chases and in, in that, but you can get eight people on there and you're not, you're not battling too hard for elbow room, but with the four of us, we can kind of lounge and spread out. Um, my wife and my kids actually always prefer sitting on the wings because they like those ch those chases. Um, but yeah, one one row. The, I think the couch really serves really serves well. Really lets you kind of cozy and, and cuddle up. Now so, I want to ask you about the um, are those uh, bean bags or some type of other seat that you have in front of the couch there. Yep, just bean bags. So I, I just grabbed those at Target. I didn't want to put a table down in front of the um, in front of the couch. So those kind of serve dual purpose. If you're sitting in those middle sections, they're, we basically use them as footrests. Or, or again, if we have another family over and we've got a load of kids, the kids often like to sit on the floor so the adults can kind of take the couch and then the kids have the bean bags and, and it, it works really well. That's pretty awesome. And you know, it's so funny, Jeremy. Um, when I first started setting up my theater, I had already picked everything out. I had the seats all picked out. I had everything in the room ready to go. And we thought we'd already spent the money on it. And then my wife comes to me shortly after she sees the seat. She liked the seat, but she said to me, you know, it would be kind of nice if we had a sectional in the back row so that I could lay down and hang out and, and relax while we're watching something. Or if I just wanted to come in and hang out, it'd be cool to have that. And at the time I was like, you know what? That is a good idea, but babe, we already spent the money on this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we went ahead and went with the standard theater seats. But after I, we finished the theater, I found that my wife, she comes in and she watches movie with me, movies with me from time to time. But she doesn't like just hanging out in there on her own. Right. Mostly because I didn't take her advice and put those sectional seats in there. <laughs> so for all you men out there who are building home theater, if you want your wife and your family to hang out with you, at least throw one thing in there that they may enjoy. It'll make it a, a much better experience for you guys. <laughs> yep. Yep. My, my wife is, she's always on one of those chases when we use the room. I'd say to you, you can probably judge the quality or the technical quality of the movie based on where I sit. Cause if it's, if it's a, you know, super high fidelity uh, quality, I'm kind of probably sitting in the middle, but if it's something that I'm a little less, a uh, little less inclined to worry about the, the experience, then I'm, I'm shuffled over, you know, sit cuddling up next to her. So. So let's see, where's your captain chair? Is it the, yeah. is it the left or is yeah, it the right? Pretty much right in the middle. I, I'll, I'll sit right in the middle or just a little bit off center of that, that line right there, either, either way. Yes. Yeah. You know, so it's funny just to piggyback on this, this uh, seating topic. So we are kind of, um, we recently replaced our theater seats. So we, end up, we actually end up doing a emerging these concepts of where you have Taurus and where you have Jeremy, where we got, a, it's a sofa that reclines and has, the headrest that will also recline as well, um, but it has, it, except it has the uh, it has armrest for the captain's chair. I had to have that in both rows, mm -hmm. but uh, but outside of that, so that we also have a chase um, on one of the sides in the back row for the exact reason that have just been mentioned by both of you gentlemen. So yeah, merging seems to be the the, the best the, the best way to get everybody to want to use the room because my wife is excited; she's very excited for these seats to come in, and so am I. Don't follow my example out there, guys that are listening to us. Don't follow my example, but listen to these guys. <laughs> you know, two, two other things that helped that too. So we grabbed the, those pillows, you know, simple stuff, but my son actually picked those out. And these are like pretty big, you know, a couple foot, a uh, couple foot by couple foot pillows. And it really makes a difference to 
lay on those or lean on them or kind of cozy up together. And then it's a basement room. So, it, you know, generally speaking, basement's always cooler. And uh, my wife, one of kind of those, those folks that's always cold wherever she goes. So that the, the black and the red sitting on the end of those chases are some crocheted blankets that my aunt made. So like that, that's what really gets everybody wanting to go in there is the, is the, you know, sit on the couch, get under the blanket, lay on a nice pillow, cozy factor. And it's uh it removes the, the barriers of, of wanting to you know, go down to the basement and, and use the room. Now, do you have AC down in the, uh, in the room there or is yeah, it its own? Yeah. yeah, it's, it's still cool. But so even in the summertime right now, we've got 90 degrees outside here today in Michigan. You know, it, it's, it's chilly in the basement and the AC running actually compounds that. It, so it's almost colder in the summertime than it is in the wintertime. So 90 degrees outside AC on, we're still sitting under those blankets down there in that room. It's awesome. You know, on this room, um, so Jeremy, with your treatments, um, what was the driver behind your treatment placement? Was it a, a plan or did you just do some measurements? Like, how did you arrive at the precise placement of your acoustic treatments on your walls? Yep. So the panels are all GIC, and um, GIC is really good in their customer service. So when you call them up and um, you send them some pictures, you send them dimensions, they'll take all the information about what you have and of the structure of your room and, and how it's placed out and they'll they made the recommendations so i basically went ahead and, and took their took their guidance so there's uh, some 242 panels on the side and some deeper 244 panels on the back wall with their scatter plates and then the the tri traps double stacked in all four corners with the, the front ones have some range limiters and the back ones are more open but all that all that came from gick i was really happy with their customer service in that regard I want to ask you about those gig panels. I always wondered the emblem, the brand emblem that you see up in the top corner there, can yep. those be removed or do they have to actually stay on? No, they're, they're glued on. When I opened them up, I was kind of like, oh, I, I almost wish they would have gave an option or some way to not, not have those on there and just have the, have the flat black. But yeah, they, they, they glue them on. So I, I haven't tried to take them off, probably a blow dryer and a little patience. But if I wanted to, they, you know, they could go, but you know, they're fast. It, it looks fantastic, but always wondered about those. And I'm pretty sure people that are watching or even listening right now, maybe wondering if those emblems can be, can be removed also, if they can easily be removed. That's good to know. Very good to know. Yeah. So now what I want to do, Jeremy, let's talk about your devices that you actually have in the room. And what I want to do is I want to pull up a video that you have of your media room and your rack. Yep. So the rack is the rack is right on the other side of the wall from the theater, right? Basically, right behind the screen. Uh, that drives the control of both our living room and the theater room. So there's more than just the the theater devices here. Is it a dedicated room, or do you use it for other purposes? Um, it's a storage room, actually. So uh, all around the the remainder of the perimeter of that room, you can kind of almost see it in some of the pictures. We built in like. Uh, five stack shelving kind of floor to ceiling and there's a little table in the middle. So Christmas lights and, in uh, you know, memory bins and all that sort of stuff is <laughs> the remainder of that room. Like the cable management. I was just admiring that. I also see some uh, watt box pieces there as well for the power management. Yep. Yeah, so if I if I walk the devices that are driving the theater, so mostly the the right side is the theater and the left side is the kind of the rest of the house. But the the theater's driven. Um, if I go bottom to top, actually, there's a Emotiva XPA 11 Gen 3 there. Um, I had some of their uh, earlier generation amps, three of them, uh, but I when the Gen 3s came out and I, I could get a single amp containing all 11 channels in one. Um, I swapped that out and, and jumped over to that. So it's got three blades for the front three that are single amps. And then the remaining blades are two amps uh, per blade, right, for the remainder of the channels at a little lower power. Uh, Marantz 807704 preamp. And then the only sources in there, there's that Kaleidoscape. Right now I've got the Strato C and a 24 terabyte Terra. Um, and then the Apple TV, we, we tend to be Apple users around the house, iPads, iPhones, and, and so on. Um, so the Apple TV fits right in. I think that's by far the best, uh, best streamer box out there. The left side of the rack is the, um, 
is items that are driving the living room. We can talk a little bit about more of that later on the upper left. The bottom left, there's control four. So our house is, our house is entirely based on control four. Um, as I mentioned, we did a, we did a custom architecture build. And so I wanted to bring a lot of technology into the house. Um, that was back around 2012. So actually it predated quite a lot of evolution in the home automation space. Um, and, but at the time control four was a pretty good shot. So everything from like our fireplace, the entire house lighting, ceiling fans, garage doors, door locks, security system, all of the AV control for both rooms and et cetera, um, is all on that control four system. We've got another eight zones of like distributed audio, both inside and outside the house on our porches that are, uh, that are also control four based. Um, so the, the controller, the, the, the matrix amp or the matrix, uh, di- switcher and the amper part of the control four gear. And at the very bottom is a uh, cyber power UPS. I did have some watt box stuff in there. Um, the, the two channels of plugs going up and down the back of the rack on both sides are watt box. And um, I had just one of their regular uh, surge protector, like line conditioners. But um, just in the last few months, actually, I swapped that out for a cyber power 1500 watt uh, uninterruptible power supply. Um, only because our, our power here tends to be a little little weak, and we'll we'll get brownouts and, and drops and such, um, you know, a, a number of times throughout the year. And we actually we have a whole house generator as well, which is awesome. I highly recommend awesome piece of kit. But it takes about ten seconds or so to switch when you do lose power or something starts to drop off. And so I wanted the UPS to kind of bridge that. So now if we do drop power, everything on that rack stays like stays safe, protected, and powered in the middle of a changeover to our generator and it works exceptional. I want to ask you, is it a gas generator, house generator that yep. you have, or is it one yep. of those Tesla power blocks or whatever they're no, called? Yep, no, uh, Generac, uh, uh, natural gas, yep, whole house. Awesome. And your projectors, that also run to the UPS? No, so that's the one thing that's off of it. Um, the way that I, I, I had that structured, the, the projector in the back of the theater room, I have a longer cord and it just goes down and plugs into one of the wall sockets in the back of the room. So that, that one is unfortunate. If we did drop power in the middle of a movie, you know, everybody, I'll, I'll, I'll pucker in my seat and hope that that bulb, uh, well, that bulb survives. But the, the, the projector and the two subs actually in the theater room are the only electronics items from either room that's not running through the UPS. Tell us a little about this um, this PC that you have. This is a very unique looking home theater PC. Or yep. what do you use it for? So I really I built that in January. Um, I picked up the new consoles when they came out, you know, at the end of last year, and and was tinkering with the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. And um, over the years, I, I've been a gamer since the original the original NES. I've I've had every system and, and played just about every major franchise in those. God, whatever it's been 30 some years but and, and over the last 10 years or so i'd say i probably flipped between pc and console a few times um and so this is one of my recent flips i, I built a computer for gaming in january um and i went with this kind of a build because my goal was to put it downstairs and so i, I found this case this is a thermal take p3 open air it's basically just a back plane board um, you can hide all your cables and wires and stuff inside of it and everything's nice and open air. Since I knew I was in the storage room, I knew it was a basement. Um, you know, I, I can crank those fans and, and I didn't need an enclosed case and it runs, you know, it runs nice and cool. So it, it ended up being a neat build, but that's, that's an 11, 900 K CPU. It's a RTX 3090 EVGA, nice. um, 32 nice. gig of Ram, uh, two terabyte Western digital, uh, PCI Gen 4 SSD. It's about as I don't think you could build much much harder, you know, or much stronger of a of a gaming PC. Now, see, um, guys, he did say that he was a computer <laughs> a computer engineer or technician. What was it? Uh, you are yeah, no computer engineer, software developer. Computer yeah. engineer. It shows. It absolutely shows, Jeremy. <laughs> it definitely does. Now, one question is, can it run Crisis? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can. Oh, uh, the, the, main, sure. the main game I the main game I cranked on that recently is I had a Red Dead Redemption Two. I had made that made it about halfway through that game on the Xbox, and um, I restarted it actually on the PC. And uh, that thing native 4K, fully cranked up on the 3090, maxed out. It's it's amazing. It's a beautiful, beautiful game. That is fantastic. Now let me let me ask this question. You may have already covered it, but. 
Are there two 3090 GPUs there? <laughs> no, there's one 3090 and one 3080. So one of the things ah. that I, I kind of mm-hmm. stumbled into when I put the PC together was the, the crypto craze and realizing, oh, maybe I can I can mine some Ethereum on this thing. And um, by virtue of where I had some pre-orders, a, a second GPU came available to me. And so I, I've, I've been running it, doing some Ethereum mining since May. I mined a, a coin and a half since then. And actually, you can look to the bottom right. There's a couple of Western digital hard drives hanging off of it as well. That's another crypto thing, this this Chia coin that that just kind of came up um, this spring as well. But the thing that's killed me with it, and I'm, I'm moving stuff around and, and trying to shuffle some things, is and my, my son's been been on me about it. He's like, Dad, you keep your PC running for crypto all the time, and we can't play games. <laughs> like, hey, you know what? Come to think of it, I don't think I fired up a game on that computer two and a half months. So I actually just sold the 3080, sold the 3080 locally. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to wind down the crypto and get it back to the, to the original purpose that I built nice. for. Yeah. Well, this is off the topic of home theater, but I have to ask because in a way it kind of does pertain to it too. Now you said you're into gaming. Mm-hmm. Are you big on E3? Do you follow what happens during E3 week? Oh yeah. I, I watch every major tech tech show event and so on that, uh, that comes along. We have that in common. I used to take the week off of work <laughs> when E3 was getting ready to take place just to be able to sit down and watch all the conferences and all of the, uh, the shows and, and reveals yep. of anything that may have been going on that week. That's fantastic, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm actually waiting to see, you know, hopefully we get that Switch Pro coming up here in a, in a week or so. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the news to kind of help me decide whether I might I might stick longer term with the PC again or or flip back to the to the consoles, but I don't know. We'll see. I've actually I've got a sealed Xbox Series X sitting on my desk, and I just can't decide what to what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> sealed. Well, the PC is definitely a very safe uh, platform because it's the most powerful. Oh yeah. Uh, the, the, the Series X is definitely a, a pretty powerful too. Um, yeah. So th- let me ask you because I, when I was very heavy into gaming and I used to do build gaming PCs uh, back then, there was Tri SLI and Quad SLI. Are those still um, mandated to really have high performance in games, or are we down to just, you know, regular SLI with two cards and that's it? Yeah, not, not even that powerful. anymore. It's it's one, one GPU uh-huh. is pretty much rules the roost nowadays. Okay, that's yep. a thirty ninety. Okay, yep. wow, fantastic. So the last question that I have on gaming for you mm-hmm. is, what game have you played in your theater? That gave you a cinematic experience when it came to video, when it came to audio. What game do you feel you remember most based on the experience that you had as you were playing in your theater? Yeah. So so my theater room, I would say, was finalized about mid-2019. So we haven't actually had it that long, even though we've been in the house about eight years. Um, and up until maybe about the midpoint or so of last year, I was playing a lot of destiny. I was a destiny player from destiny one into destiny two, you know, high end clan. And we did all the raids. So not nothing beat doing a, doing a destiny raid down there on the big screen, right? Big screen, crank it up. And, uh, you know, just, just do that content, being online with friends and that sort of thing. So that, that was, that was a lot of the gaming that I've used the theater for so far. I've kind of found my way out of destiny now though. But um, I mentioned playing Red Dead 2 on the Xbox. And I did most of the Xbox run of that game down there, uh, you know, for a, as a cinematic game, right? Walking through the Western wilderness and looking out over cliffs, edges and that sort of thing. That's about as cinematic of a, as you can get. So Now, for those who are interested in building a theater, for those who have one and you just have an inkling of an interest in gaming, there is no more of an immersive experience outside of VR, than playing a video game inside of your theater. I'm not a VR guy. Playing uh, video games in my theater, especially cinematic games like Uncharted, the Uncharted series, God of War, were just fantastic. You cannot beat the big screen, big sound experience. Calling all video game, movie, TV, and home theater fans. You're listening to the Fun Waste of Time podcast, where we love to talk shop about your favorite hobbies and all the fun ways to waste your day. So outside of games, how else do you like to use your theater? 
you know, for, for me, that's that's pretty much it. Movies is movies is the main thing. Um, at one point, I thought I might find my way down there listening to some music, maybe with my wife. And, but honestly, since we put the room together in 2019, we haven't done that once. Um, although with COVID and all the events and stuff shut down, I've, I've contemplated inviting some friends over and checking out some of like the concerts on Kaleidoscape. Um, so I've had that in my mind, but we haven't done it. So it, it's really movies. Um, yeah, I, I, we talked about the living room and, and I, I kind of like duly invested into the theater and quite a bit into the living room setup as well. And so I'd say we, um, so some things we tend to use the living room for some things we tend to use the theater for. And when it's movie time, we usually go down. If it's just TV, TV show time or casual watching, then we usually stick to the living room. Although we did go down to the theater for the Mandalorian. Um, listen with the concerts do those man as soon as you can yeah get some friends over do, do the concerts um, set a mode in your processor that ups the surround levels a little bit to, so you can hear the crowd really be a, and you feel like you're really a part of the crowd I'm telling you just do it ASAP man we, yeah, we were gonna miss um, or we were gonna buy tickets actually a Def Leppard it was Def Leppard Poison and another one were coming as a combo through Detroit and with COVID, uh, we didn't get to see that one, but I know there's a couple of Def Leppard concerts on the Kaleidoscape. So, yeah, we need to. I need. I need to try that out. I, I've had it in my mind to do it, and just we just haven't done it yet. How do you feel about the Kaleidoscape, by the way? Oh, I love it. So, going back a longer time, um, I mean, I think a lot like Matt. I, I've done the DIY media thing for for a while since, uh, like, back to 2007, 2008. I think it's first started re really being viable to kind of rip your own media and set up your own systems. So at one point, you know, I, I had the 12 base Synology with, with close to hundred terabytes of content on it. And I've done the jailbroken oppos and in, in every other kind of streaming device from the dunes to the Zipedes and, and so on in between. Um, and I, and I tossed all that stuff aside a couple of years ago and just, just bought in on Kaleidoscape. Um, I kind of got tired of, of managing that stuff and like the Kaleidoscape just makes it so easy. Um, the, the, the experience of using the thing, um, you know, that I'm, I'm a stickler for like the technical aspects of quality. So, you know, a platform that has higher bit rates, even than disc, you know, hundreds of more movies available in 4k than available on disc, all, all the same selling points. I think, right. Folks have talked about a lot. Um, that's kind of what, what drew me over to it. So it definitely runs a point in the theater. Do you still buy physical media at all, or have you just completely gone digital? No, I'm digital everything. I don't think I haven't bought a video game on disc since the mid Xbox 360 era. Um, I, I don't think there's a single movie on disc in this house anymore. Um, no CDs. Um, the only thing, the only thing that I still buy physical a bit is books. We really, we really value reading and books and a lot, as you can see in, in the living room picks, I think to come a whole back wall of the living room is book bookshelves. So that that's the only remnant of physical media in our house. And it's funny because I'm like you, when it comes to my games, I haven't bought physical media since the 360 era, yep. um, either, but I will say just recently I bought a physical Blu-ray hmm. and cause I have a kaleidoscape as well. We did, Matt. Blasphemy. Uh -oh. <laughs> Madness. <laughs> the only reason I did is because Kaleidoscape, believe it or not, all of the thousands of movies that they have in their library, they did not have this one movie. And I wanted the director's cut of this movie, but they didn't have it at all. It was Brotherhood of the Wolf. The French kind of uh, fantasy period uh, action movie that came out in the early 2000s. And I was really in the mood to watch that. I saw somebody post about it on one of the home theater Facebook groups, and I hadn't seen it since it came out in the theater, which is where I last saw it. And so I was like, you know what? I haven't seen that in a while. Let me go ahead and, and see if I can get that on Kaleidoscape. It wasn't available on Kaleidoscape. wasn't available anywhere on Apple TV. No platform actually had it. So the only way that you could watch it was if you bought the Blu-ray. And luckily, Amazon had the Blu-ray available to be delivered next day to my area. So I went ahead and purchased it and watched it that night when it arrived. Had a fantastic experience with it. And it's so funny because I have not watched a physical media anything in my theater since I got my Kaleidoscape. So it's been like a year since I actually turned on my OPPO uh, uh, 203. <laughs> <laughs> Almost didn't know how to use it anymore, Matt. <laughs> I know. You have to be like, where, where, what, what, the menu? 
Cobwebs are, are right there where the drive opens, you know. Yeah. It hadn't been used in so long. There were actual cobwebs on the screen <laughs> in the actual uh, user interface. So funny. <laughs> <laughs> That is that, fantastic. That is funny. That is funny. But yeah, all, all digital is awesome. It really yeah. is. It really yeah. is. And if you can go that way, I highly suggest it. Even those, if you can't necessarily buy into the Kaleidoscape ecosystem, if you have to do the, the, um, you know, the Cody or the, um, like any of the, other, the, the, the plexes and, and mm-hmm. that kind of things of the world, go ahead and do it because it will provide you, once you actually get it ripped, it's nice not to have to constantly go back and grab the physical media all the time to watch whatever it is you're, you're trying to watch. So definitely there's a place for Plex and, and Cody and that kind of thing. So what I want to do now, Matt, is, uh, is uh, talk to Jeremy about the build process and transforming the space that he actually used for his theater into what he has now. So give me one second. I'm actually going to pull up the... The space right now. So tell us what we're looking at, Jeremy, if you don't mind. Yep. So that that's the same room. Um, you know, when, when we built the house, I, integrating uh, audio, video, and, and technology into it was was a big part of of what I wanted to do. And then I don't know if you guys have, have ever built the house before, but there's a lot of budget creep and and all kinds of different things happen as as you go through the process and. Um, as we did, trying to find, okay, where do we want to put the theater? How would we integrate this stuff? Um, I more or less kind of convinced myself out of dedicating dedicating a room and dedicating a space for it. And I took on the idea that, well, all right, I'll, I'll go ahead and we'll make the living room be the focal point of audio, video, and entertainment, and that sort of thing. So the room that the theater ended up being was never designed to be the theater, and that's what we're looking at here. We actually built it as a home gym. So if you want to go back really quick, one second, the, the, we lined two of the walls with mirrors. We had a ceiling fan in there, an older TV mounted. Um, we, the goal was to actually, you know, outfit this room with gym equipment and, and, and use it as a workout room. Um, this picture's taken probably six years after we moved in. You can see there's no gym equipment in that room. <laughs> um, it kind of became spillover storage. So like I mentioned earlier, I love the gym. I work, I try to work out every weekday, but I quickly found out, you know, I really don't want to do this at home. I like going away to do it. You know, if I'm doing it at home, my kids are there coming in. I, I like to check out and, and focus. And so we never did anything with the room, but in the same time up in the living room, I, I upgraded that to some Atmos setup and some other things, but it just wasn't performing to the level that I wanted it to be. And so I was contemplating some changes in the living room, maybe taking out some of the in walls. I think we'll look at that in a little bit um, and putting in some floor standards. And we were, and I was talking with my wife about it and I had floated the idea about the maybe converting the, the gym room a couple of times and it never really took any root. And, uh, and then we had, we had family over for dinner one night and I was talking with a couple of my brothers-in-law and I'm, and I'm like, yeah, I'm thinking about doing this and putting some speakers in this room and changing it up. And so she finally commented, she's like, well, if you're going to put speakers in that room, put them downstairs. And why don't you just convert the gym room? So that was it. Um, I w- that was 2018. And I was building, uh, starting to build this space out by, by that summer. So, you know, some of the challenges, we had to get all that glass off. All those mirrors were fastened with glue onto the walls. So some uh, some friends came over and we, with some hefty gloves and pr- eye protection and some crowbars, we we pulled all that glass down, um, had to basically patch, you know, patch everything up. I'm not much of a tradesperson, so thankfully my poor patch and paint job is largely hidden behind the curtains and the acoustic panels. But um, one of the constraints that I had was I didn't really want to tear, other than taking the glass down I- inside the walls, I didn't want to tear anything up going into the walls. So. Um, I didn't want to cut into anything. I didn't want to rebuild anything. I didn't want to touch the trim, um, you know, the crown trim and, and the, the baseboard trim and that sort of thing. So I was working entirely in between those spaces. It is light controlled. So I had that going for me. And, and, and because it's a dedicated room that we were sealing off, I was able to get, you know, get full black and, and, and paint full black and build it out full black. So it, it's, it's pitch dark down there. Um, and, you know, Matt and I were having a discussion earlier today about our theaters being in different locations throughout our home. 
he has his like you in his basement. Mm. And I have mine upstairs on the second floor so that I can have access to the attic to be able to drop down anything that I want to upgrade or update a little later down the line. So you're right. When you have a basement theater, it can be difficult to upgrade any equipment that you want in the room if you're trying to put the wires in the wall and, and through the ceiling and, and that kind of thing. So fully really understand the route that you chose to uh, get all of your equipment in there and get it all set up. Now, I'm noticing the, the panels, not the panels, but the electrical outlets, and it looks like that's an Ethernet port that's in the wall there. That's from the TV. So did you use that for your anything on your screen or anything of that nature there, or is it still just not being used back there? No, they're just sitting there behind, behind the screen. I, I thought about trying to leverage those for some like backlighting on the screen itself, but I, I didn't end up going that route. Um, Yep. So, so they're just dormant. The, the one thing that the one thing that saved me in the space as well, though, was like I mentioned, the the rack um, is right on the other side of the wall from the wall that the screen is on. So I only had to to get through basically one wall to get cables and wires and all of that stuff in. And what I did to get around not tearing stuff up was we see the boards here um, was the curtains. So I I, I took these two by fours and these other assorted boards and everything that's mounted on the walls is kind of mounted off of those boards. So the curtains hang off the boards, the screen actually hangs off the boards. So the, the curtains kind of sit nicely behind it um, and it obscures everything. So with some plastic uh, like wire channel from Home Depot, I was able to route everything around the room. You can kind of see it, how it goes right there. That's the back wall. There's actually a closet there. So the curtains, curtains cover up that closet door as well right where their projector is. So to get to the, what would be the left um, side surround channel, I come all the way across the front wall to the right, down the side wall, across this back wall, up and over the closet door, back down to the corner and cut the next wall over to get to that speaker. But everything's ran in the, it's just little plastic clip channeling, sticky, you know, sticky tack onto the wall. And then the curtains, the curtains hide it all. So the, the depth of those channels is a little bit less than the depth of the wood boards that the curtains are, are Velcroed onto. And it's all perfect. So I can get to anything. I, I, I could change speakers. I could change, you know, projector, change an HDMI cable. I can get anything anywhere in this room running through those channels all behind those curtains, you know, with uh, without even having to pull anything or or any, any trouble at all. So that's a super smart idea. And I think a lot of people could benefit from doing something like that, who have a similar situation uh, to what you've experienced. And the great thing about those curtains too, is they provide acoustical treatment as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, curtains go with home theater spaces. So I really wanted that front wall to be kind of curtain based and, you know, come down the side walls a little bit and uh, your reflected light right off the off the sides of your screen. The curtains help diffuse that. So it kind of holds it holds the the brightness of the projector and anchors it a good bit, gives you some extra acoustical benefit. And, and again, hides all that, hides all the mechanicals of the room. Let's take a look at that again. Those curtains that you have going on in the room. So we just looked at where he placed the boards along the sides there and. This yep. is the kind of the skirt that he has going on along the bottom. And I like the fact that you put that there. And not only is it really covering the, the wiring that you have going on along the sides there, but it's also covering the white baseboard too, to provide more darkness yep. in the room as well. That's a really smart thing to do too. And then if we look up top here, we can see that he has a curtain going along the, the top where the window is, yep. excuse me, the, yeah, the, where the window was placed. So that's a big glass block window that goes to the, what is our backyard outside. Um, and the curtains work to obscure that as well. If it's really bright outside, the curtains alone do let a little bit of the light through there, but we usually tend to use the room at night. So it's, it's a bit of a non-issue. And in the summertime, um, there's actually a bunch of plants grown and landscaping in front of it. So it helps, but I, I did make some mistakes up in that glass block window as well. So one of the things that I tried to do with it first was I bought some some thick, like two inch heavy foam. And I tried to plug, plug up that space. And, uh, I don't know if either of you guys can guess what, what the problem that you get when you plug up a, an exterior window from airflow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Start to suffocate. Yeah. Heavy. 
condensation, yes. condensation. So, okay. unbeknownst to me, at first with that whole that whole space, you can see it right there. I blocked that whole thing off, and it was great. I I, I completely took that window out of the equation. But another time, I was up there fidgeting with something, and it's like, oh my gosh, it's all wet back here. So the the inside of the window was condensing, and the water was pooling in there. So I tried instead. I took the foam and I cut like the top three or so inches off of it still to have the foam blocking some of the the light but trying to give it breathing room and that even still wasn't enough so i've I've taken the foam completely out now and it's just the curtain i think what i might need to do going forward is is try to solve the problem on the outside and go you know go do something to to really block that window off or cover it up in the garden bed outside rather than inside um or else you know i don't think there's anything else i can do that doesn't risk more condensation and, and water damage. The last thing I want to deal with is any water going down a basement wall. You know, Jeremy, on your on the, the channel that you ran to run your speakers, uh, a couple of things. Well, first, I have drywall PTSD from running all of my cables. So seeing that, <laughs> very, very jealous. Um, but uh, secondly, the, the way you have them attached, I know that they, I've used them in a previous theater to run cabling and then I had, and, and I know you can paint them to match the wall. But yep. um, are you using the adhesive? Because over time, I saw that Mine would come off. Have you screwed them, screwed the, them into the wall before pulling the flap over, or are you using adhesive to to adhere them to the wall? Just the adhesive, um, just the adhesive that came on them. So we'll see if that holds. If I have to do anything else, um, I did have to do some things on the curtains though. So the curtains, um, we were actually going to make them ourselves. My wife is a crafter, a quilter, a little bit of a seamstress, and that sort of thing. But then as we started getting into the project, it's like, wow, this is going to take a lot of time to make these. And, you know, she's got other stuff to do. So I, I called a local T-shirt shop and asked if they knew anybody in the area that would would do kind of custom curtainry or, or custom sewing. And I ended up I ended up finding a, a local person that that came and made them for me. And but they're they're fastened with Velcro. And so she sewed, you know, one side of the Velcro strip along the top of the curtains. And then I took the other side of the Velcro strip as a sticky tack and then just stuck it onto the top of the board and then put all the curtains up that way. But some of them proved to be too heavy. So the the smaller uh, like side skirts that are lower to the floor have been fine. Those are staying fine with just the sticky. But over the course of the, the first couple of months, I'd come in the room and one section or another, the curtains was down on the floor, like the floor to ceiling sections. So I did, I just grabbed some little nails and, and nailed the, the sticky side or the, the board side of the Velcro in and they bet they're holding, they're holding fine sense then. So that the sticky on the Velcro did give out on me on some of the heavier sections of curtains, but the channels for the wiring has been fine so far. I haven't, uh, I haven't walked in to see anything sitting on the floor. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm looking at the curtain behind the screen. So do you just have curtain around the sides of the screen or does it really go completely behind the screen? Um, not directly behind it. So we did, it, it's floor to ceiling sections to the right and left of the screen. And then there's a, a smaller strip of curtain above the screen and a smaller strip below it. Um, yeah. Cause the screen, the, again, the screen is on like, uh, so uh, the screen itself is on two by four. So the fixed frame Stewart screen has its channels. So on the wall is the two by four, the channels for the Stewart mounting is on that. And then so d- directly behind the screen in between those two by fours is just, just wall, no curtain. And it just, it just wraps it around the side, but there's a little bit of overflow. So it does, it looks pretty seamless. So it, it, it looks like the curtain, you know, the curtain does go down behind the top edge of the screen and then terminates. And then under at the bottom of the screen, you know, an inch or two up underneath it is where kind of that curtain starts. And what I like is once the lights are actually off, it is a sea of nothing but blackness there. Yep. Absolutely. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's, that screen just floats and everything goes away. The speakers, you can see it in the pics, the speakers give a little bit of some reflection because those so, the focals and even the subs are kind of shiny. Um, it's the price of beauty. That's the price of beauty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still like looking at them. So let me ask you, do you put a, a piece of uh, uh, velvet or any other black material over it so that it doesn't glare? Yeah. Like you, the speaker? You or, could, but yeah. you don't do that? No. 
Now, I'm, I'm kind of, it's like living next to the train tracks, right? I'm, I'm used to it now. <laughs> I don't, I don't hear the train anymore. That is fantastic. Yeah, Jeremy, I'm definitely with you. I used to have some high gloss uh, speakers from Legacy Audio. And uh, yeah, I, I, the first time I fired it up with the projector, I started seeing reflections left and right. And after about 20 minutes, yeah. never saw it again. Yeah. Never saw it or thought about it again. And we're seeing the curtains under the, under the screen here, right above the baseboard. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I'm considering getting this myself, I'm seeing the Control 4 Neo remote mm -hmm. over yep. here. My infrastructure, my uh, automated home automation infrastructure is Control 4 as well. That's okay. the control system I use in my theater. But I've got the SR260 remotes. I've got nine of them throughout the house. How do you like this Neo remote? So I'd say I do and I don't, honestly. I, I had the 260s before, and then the Neos came out, and uh, I, I went ahead and I had to upgrade my controller, too. I've got an EA5 in there. Um, I think I upgraded that about like a year or so ago. They're fine. I, I really wish they would have put hard-button transport controls on them. They had the room on the remote to do it on the bottom section that's just flat. So dealing with the touchscreen parts is, is kind of a pain sometimes. Um, they feel very premium. Um, they feel good in the hand and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and I, I generally like them. I think they feel nicer than the two sixties, but I, I think they could have made a, they could have made a more versatile remote if they at least would have put transport controls and stuff on them. The only thing about my two sixties that annoy me is the, the screen sometime is too dim. Mm. I don't know if you've, if you've ever experienced that with the two sixty remote, but like I said, I have nine, and some of them work better than others. They're not really consistent when it comes to the lighting that you get off of that, uh, that little screen that's there. Okay. The remote is fantastic itself, yeah. but there are times when I'm covering you know, the top of the screen, the top of the uh, remote, where the, uh, the sensor is, to see if maybe that will adjust the light a little bit more so that I can see what's going on there. Um, that's the only thing that's annoying to me about the... 260 remote, which is one of the reasons why I was considering upgrading at least a few of my remotes mm -hmm. to the Neo. So that's yeah. definitely something to consider. I say, I mean, they, they feel more advanced. It's, it's, um, when you put your icons on the home screen of the Neo, like our fireplace in the living room, it, it's not an animated icon, but the, the, it, it shows you state. So when your fireplace is off, you see logs when the fireplace is on, it's logs with fire. And it, it's, it's in the, the, you know, the Nintendo switch has the little switch logo and the PlayStation button looks like a PlayStation. So it feels pretty contemporary and a little, little better because of that. But in some respects though, you know, we use, I use the Kaleidoscape in the theater, but I use an Apple TV in both zones and I just picked up the new one. And, and quite honestly, I'm, I'm, I've been working over the last probably week and a half to, to diminish the use of the Neo and, and actually just go to use the Apple TV remote because it just feels it works better with that device when you use it. And it, 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 it enables more capabilities than, you know, than the Neo might hope to deliver. So. That is very interesting. You know, with control for, um, I know back, you said in 2012 is when you, um, is when you yeah. first got your house built, correct? So when you were, when you're making that selection between control for and Crestron or Savant, um, what, what drove you towards control for, I, I remember Savant was kind of new. They used to have to stick an iPod into the remote yeah. chassis, et cetera. But what drove you to make that choice? So the, the installer that did a lot of our house pulled all the wiring and helped set up a bunch of stuff, um, was the one that worked with our dealer or our builder. And he happened to be a control four guy. So kind of worked that through with him. But back at that time, there, what, there wasn't really a lot of options in, in restaurants, Savant. I mean, a lot of it was price. You know, th those other solutions get a lot pricier. Um, not that Control 4 was <laughs> was dirt cheap or anything, too. We, you know, we still spent a decent amount of money getting everything set on it. Um, but the, the combination of those two, the, what they offered, the accessibility, working with the dealer that we were working with and the builder we were working with, and then, then the ultimate cost. I kind of, honestly, I kind of have a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. Um, and if I were doing a house today, I don't know that I would necessarily choose it again versus, and, and actually the way that we've used the automation in the house, I would probably even do less automation than we actually have. Um, but 
at this point, we're kind of stuck with it because we've got like their light switches literally everywhere. And in a lot of places, a lot of our lighting zones, we pulled the actual switches to the pantry of our kitchen. So you go inside our pantry and you close the door and there's, I don't even know how many, maybe like 30 light switches in there. Because throughout the house, we didn't locate the switches. We put the little six button panels for more programming and capability. And now I'm like, I'm super stuck because if I ever wanted to take that out, we're not walking to the pantry to change the, you know, turn the lights on and off in the, in the living room. But, you know, I, I like to do a lot of stuff myself. And, and again, I'm pretty proficient with software in the programming aspect of it. So the things that I'm not too keen on for control four is like, I can't add and remove my own devices. One of the saving graces for me is I actually kind of became friends with, uh, with the installer that did our house. Um, I think he's a lot like us, shares a lot of the same interests. And so he, he's, he's pretty accommodating to me. It's like, Hey Dan, I, I just changed the Apple TVs out. Can you go into the system and, and you know, add this or remove that and, and rebind this thing, the HDMI four, four versus two. Cause I just tweaked all this stuff. I don't know that all dealers would be willing to do that, especially without, you know, charging for it. So that's been a bit of a saving grace, but you know, the, the, their home programming software, I think has a lot of room to improve. There's not a Mac version. And I, I found some of it to not always be like completely, you know, completely reliable or completely up. So I, I'm stuck with it and I'll try to make the most of it going forward. But I, I would say that's actually, like, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jeremy. Okay. That's actually a discussion that Matt and I had earlier today about getting service for your control for once yep. your system is actually built, having continual support to be able to add devices and troubleshoot issues that actually happen if you don't have a uh, subscription-based service of some sort to have them come back and actually work on those systems for on that system for you adding in that new Xbox Series X yep. in your remote some um, you know troubleshooting any handshaking issues that you may have maybe with a new TV or something you know that you may be adding to your your infrastructure a little later on down the line mm -hmm. I'm lucky to where I actually had Magnolia, which is Best Buy's home theater group here in San Antonio, do our um, install for us, our control for inf uh, install. And one of the services that they offer is something called Mag Care, right? Magnolia Care basically is what it is. And for a yearly fee, they will come to your house whenever you're upgrading something in your, in your infrastructure. If you're changing something out and you need the programming to reflect that, mm -hmm. they will take care of that for you based on you paying into the subscription service. Okay. And it's not cheap by any means, but it's not something that I find to be um, not worth the cost. Right. Um, it, it's well worth the cost, actually. It's about four to five hundred bucks, sure. uh, depending on where you are, I think. But we pay into that and they come back and work on the system for us uh, in any capacity that we need. The only problem with, uh, Best Buy and Control 4 now is they are not a Control 4 dealer anymore. So I can't upgrade my firmware because they don't have access to the newer updates, the newer firmware updates in Control 4. So I have to leave my firmware, where my operating system where it is, so that they will have the, the firmware, the program to be able to work my system. So there are some, some headaches that come along with having a control force system, but I'm pretty sure it's similar to having any yeah. of these, these automated systems that we were putting in our homes. Right. So we're dealing with control four, but I'm pretty sure there are others that may be dealing with Savant. There's some that may be dealing with Crestron and that kind of thing. But it's something that we work through and it, it's just, you know, the, the price we pay for having a, a premium system in our home. Yep. You're listening to the, the Fun Waste of Time podcast. And, and you know, with that premium system, so, uh, Jeremy, if you look at your, your main level uh, setup versus your dedicated theater setup, a uh, couple questions for you. A, how often does the family join you in dedicated use? Are you sitting down and actually watching a movie for both rooms? And then also between those two, if you had to pick, so dedicated theater, if you had to pick between your dedicated theater and a the commercial theater, which one would you pick? And the same for your main level, because your main level room is excellent. If you had to pick between your main level room and a commercial theater, which would you pick? Yeah, so I guess in terms of how often we use the space or um, 
my wife and or I'll say me and both of my kids, we, we like screen entertainment. My wife, she does too, but definitely she's number four. Um, so I, I'd say we probably watch a movie a week in the theater room with COVID, maybe more on average, like two. Um, but if we do something else like TV shows or doc, we tend to watch a lot of documentary type stuff. We'll often do that in the living room. Um, we actually had to go to like a, to a pick structure, choosing movies in a family of four is tough. So now we, we cycle our pick um, where it's okay. It's your turn, then your turn, then your turn and your turn. Cause there's no consensus to be had for what, what anybody actually wants to watch. Um, and we do a lot of board games and stuff too. So we've been cycling that stuff in to try to, try to eliminate some of the, the screen screen time. It's funny, like for, for everything that I put into my theater space and everything I put in my living room space, um, I like all these other kids that are all these other friends that our kids know, like watch so much more TV and movies than we do. And we're like, we're the ones that are at the apex of, of what we have in our system. But in terms of like the commercial theater too, I'd say I'm, I'm done. Um, I, I've been done with commercial theater for a long time. I, I have just no interest in it. I think in the last several years, I might've been there four times and every one of those has been star Wars. Um, you know, Rogue one in the, in the three, um, we actually missed solo at the theater. We, at the commercial theater, we watched solo in our room for the first time when we saw it, that's been it. Um, I, I just have no, even COVID aside and all of that stuff. I, I love movies and, but I, I really, I really don't like theater. I actually just recently went back to the commercial theater after a year, two months and two weeks mm. of being away from the commercial theater. And I got to tell you, I didn't miss it. Yeah. I didn't miss it at all. And the reason for that is when I walked into the theater, it's a premium theater. It's pretty nice. But I guess because they don't have the staff that they used to, the theater wasn't as clean as I'm used to seeing it. Right. So they don't have ushers coming in, cleaning it. Uh, I think what happened is I typically go in the morning. So I catch one of the first shows of the day on the weekend, typically. And I guess they had a late night showing in that same theater and they didn't clean it out after the audience left after the general public left. So when I come in the next morning at about 9.30, I got there at about 9.15 or so. There was popcorn on the floor. There was a bit of food in the seats. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sitting there looking at this and I'm thinking, see, this is why I don't miss this. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah. This is why I don't miss this. You know, um, I, I, I truly believe there's a place for the commercial theater and it's an important thing for us to have. It's a communal experience. And I think it's important for us to have that. But for those like us, who have really nice theaters, there's not much of a need for us to go to the commercial theater because our theaters are either equivalent to the commercial theater or it surpasses it. Absolutely. And I had a, I had somebody on um, one of the, I made a post about it on um, the Facebook, the Fun Waste of Time Facebook page. And one of the guys texted, um, posted back and he said, well, when you have a theater like you do, you know, I understand why you don't miss it. And I responded to him. I was like, yeah, you're right. But at the same time, um, anybody that has a nice, comfortable theater, no matter how much they paid for it, is going to have a more premium experience in most cases than going to the commercial theater. I agree. You know, so. Yeah, I, I would I would sit in my living room for a movie over over a commercial theater. I would, too. I would, too. I got to tell you, um, the only time I went to the commercial theater originally was to not be spoiled for big blockbuster action packed movies that I wanted to see. Because when you, you know, when you're watching YouTube or you listen to a podcast or something like that, somebody will always spoil some story beat or, you know, some plot point for you and it just ruins a movie. So what I would do, I'd go to the theater, watch the movie one time and that's it. Come back home, wait for the Kaleidoscape download to drop or wait for the 4K Blu ray before I actually had my Kaleidoscape. So, I'm right there with you when it comes to enjoying your home experience as opposed to the commercial theater experience, Jeremy. Yep. Yeah, nothing beats the pause button. Um, make your own snacks and popcorn. I, everything's just better. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, very true. So the next thing that I want to ask you, Jeremy, is of all the components that you have in your theater, which one would you say that you are most proud to have? Now, we all know that every component and device that we have makes the full experience. But what's that one thing that when you're in your theater, you say to yourself, man, I'm glad I have this. Yeah, one is one is tough. So 
I think I think the kaleidoscape adds a lot. Um, and and just walking down there and having that on the screen, navigating right to the movie and getting right in is is sweet. Um, but the thing that probably was the most impactful is, is the pace of the panels. Um, and what I would what I, what how I would describe that is just a little bit before we had the panels, we watched um, Aquaman. So before the panels, right? It was we still had the curtains, but there was a lot of a lot of drywall, just just empty wall space in there. And Aquaman runs a pretty pretty deep base heavy track through a lot of it. And if you remember the scene where he's going to get the trident and that like sea monster comes out, there's some rumble in there. My wife and I were watching it, and I, I thought the house was going to come down on us with, with the way <laughs> the base was coming out of that track and reverberating around that room, and I think like intensifying. In pressure, pressurizing, it was, it was almost literally, I mean, watching Aquaman, it felt like being underwater, right? Um, and just pressurizing the room. And to the point where, like, it, it wasn't enjoyable. It went past the point of being being good to the point of being just muddy and just just o- overdone. And so once once we got the panels in and everything everything there was set, I went back to Aquaman and I watched that scene again, you know, similar volume and, and so on. And it was like, it was astounding. Everything that was muddy and heavy and overbearing was just straight and tight and smooth. And so um, over years of reading ABS and reading all kinds of things about home theater builds and, you know, people saying you can spend as much as you want on speakers, but it's the room and the environment and the acoustics that make the difference. Like, I I believe that 100 percent. Absolutely. That's um. Those those panels take that room and they just lock it. They lock it down into being um, the, a next level type of experience. And and for you know the focals and the quality of those speakers, the panels the panels let them do their thing the right way. That is an absolute fact. You know, Jeremy. Uh, once upon a time, I had the those exact same panels from GIK. I had the two four twos, the two four fours, and the tri traps. And when I first had those installed into um, a previous theater of mine, I was so blown away by just playing material that I was f- familiar with. I would, and this is before I was married and had children, so I had all the time in the world. Um, so I would, I took them all off the wall, pulled the tri traps out of the corner, put them in the next room, played a track. Then I would come, reinstall them, play it again. I did this for about 10, 10 different clip, movie clips. And I was just, I was just astounded at the differences Treatments properly placed and properly specified, they make all the difference. I mean, they can make much more of a difference than the actual speaker selection itself. Absolutely. All right. So now what I do want to do, Jeremy, is I want to talk a little bit about your living room. Because you've done some pretty cool things in there too. So talk to us a little bit about this space. I want to play a video first of the space, and then we'll have you get into the discussion of what it is you've done with it think people will be interested to see and hear this too. Now, what are we looking at, Jeremy? So um, right now in the living room, that's a Sony 85 inch uh, X900H. And then in the walls there on either side, it's a 2.2 setup, uh, treated speakers, uh, silver LCRs. And bronze, um, I think it's the eight inch uh, subwoofers. The, the install here of the TV, that's all custom. I, I visioed that out when we did the, the room build to basically create this bump out, giving, giving kind of like integrated columns to put speakers and in walls into, and then being able to set the TV back into it with some room behind it to try to mount, you know, some source components and that sort of thing. But, you know, the, the, the story of all, all my setup really begins in the living room because I tried to make this be our, our primary entertainment space and then invested more into it than, than actually over the years kind of bailed back out of it. So the, here's, here's the actual build of, of what that wall looks like. So in the earliest incarnation of the room, that upper section above the TV, it's kind of angled down. That's where we actually had the, the left, center, right. The subwoofers were down below. And then I think, like we mentioned earlier, all those other speakers up in the ceiling and it, it just, it didn't, it didn't really work. I like, I love the setup except for like, there's, there's the picture 
that's our earlier TV as well. That was a 75 inch Vizio 4K, I think there. Um, but having the speakers up, shooting down, in addition to having surrounds up with you know angled um, angled faces, and then trying to put Atmos speakers directly overhead, all the sound in that that so that's what was up on the ceiling there. All the sound was up above, coming down. And we've got 10 foot ceilings in the room, which is further kind of, or no, sorry, nine foot ceilings, further kind of stretching that that audio out from the ceiling down to the couch. And I just wasn't really, wasn't really feeling it. So we pulled stuff out of there, sold a lot of that. Um, and at one point, actually, I pulled it all the way back to just having the TV and a sound bar. Um, so in, in the course of, of a really, relatively short period of time, we actually... Um, so I took all those speakers out. We, we had a, somebody come in, mudded, drywalled, painted it all up, went to the sound bar, hated the sound bar, and said, now I want some real speakers in here. And by that time, I actually hadn't sold all of the in walls. So um, we brought the guys, brought the installers back and reopened some spaces in the walls. My wife loved that. Um, yeah, we just paid the guy to the mud and repaint everything. We're going to go ahead and cut those holes back open. But I, I dropped the left and the right channels down. So instead of being up in that angled section, now they actually flank the TV. And so that, that setup in the room, that's what it is right there today, is a 2.2 Phantom Center, you know, with, with the 85-inch 4K. And that, that system kicks, you know, that flat panel, that new flat panel that Sony is really awesome, very bright amazing hdr performance and the, the you know that's those are legit speakers just just in walls big in walls um but i find myself you know oftentimes completely satisfied <laughs> you know just sitting in, in that room and and watching content or, or playing games and that sort of thing um yeah my eye went straight to this right here as i was looking at the room the controller that you have here Oh yeah, the, it's an Xbox controller. That's an Elite controller, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, the Elite Series Two, best controller ever made. Nice, and yeah, that that's a pretty nice bright screen. Yeah, I, I really like I really like that Sony. I, I upgraded to it uh, for a couple of reasons just last fall. One, because I want I wanted to get more size in there. When we moved in, 4K wasn't a thing. 2012. Um, so the first TV that we had in this room was an 80 inch Vizio 1080p. And then I think it was in 2016, right? The 4, 4Ks finally were kind of becoming available at size. So we switched over to a 75 inch 4K and man, it was hard to go from 80 to 75. Um, I, I felt that difference. Even my daughter at the time, she's 11 now. Uh, so she was only what, five or six. She, she just, she's a little uh, audio file, video file in training. She was so bent out of shape that the TV got smaller. <laughs> so i've been jones in and just waiting waiting for a long time to get back up into an 80 inch plus screen and so finally now that that, that sony did the trick but i also got it too because that's an hdmi 2.1 tv and with the new consoles and you know very low refresh rate and 120 hertz i wanted to get i wanted to, to try all that stuff out that's one of the reasons why I almost actually gaming in the living room in some ways it's superior to gaming in the theater because you can't get VRR, you can't get 120 Hertz down yes. there, right? The, the the equipment's just not there yet. We'll see maybe the next run of JVCs and Sony projectors start to bring that stuff into it. Um, although I'll, I'll wave the flag a little bit at, at Sony for kind of failure to deliver actually on some of those features. So this 900H is, is one of the blurry 120s. So even though I've got the PC capable of cranking out native 4K 120 hertz, I don't use it because the TV needs it, needs its fixes and updates to to render that in a non blurry way. But even it, it pays off regardless of that because if you if you're only using HDMI 2.0, particularly with a computer, and particularly if you want to do HDR, get pretty techy. But you're either stuck running RGB 8 bit which is going to look really good, but it's not 10-bit color, or you've got to go 422 12-bit, which really dithers everything out. You take a you take a computer with a GPU and an HDMI 2.1 output, hook it up to a TV like this, and you set it up for real 444 color 12-bit at 60 hertz, and it's it it's amazing. It it's so everything is so clear, sharp, and and 
So, you know, and you need greater than 18 gigabit HDMI bandwidth to do that. So you need HDMI 2.1 to do it. So the TV is not blurry at 60, even at that color setting, but I, I haven't really had much opportunity to explore 120 hertz yet until they fix it. And we're still waiting on VRR, um, the firmware update for variable refresh rate. But so th that aside, hopefully Sony gets on the ball and makes those updates. But that that's that's what really, you know, brought brought my gaming upstairs from downstairs um, in a lot of cases. And you can actually see in this picture, I just sent you guys these updated ones. Um, I just brought the PC up um, a couple of days ago um, to directly connect. Yeah, noticing that it's, it's kind of in the middle of the bottom of your screen here. That, that doesn't bother you? Mm. No, no, I mean, that's not the way it's going to stay. Um, what, what I'm actually considering doing is if you look at that window over to the left of the TV, um, there's a little bit of space under that window. And I found a nice cabinet, you know, two door accent style cabinet that would perfectly let that PC set inside, whereby when I'm not using it, close the doors. It's just a nice little farmhouse looking cabinet under the window. But when I'm ready to game, obviously you can't run a PC like that with the doors closed or be calling the fire department. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, you just pop those doors open. It's no big deal. Let the doors sit open and then the PC has a, the PC has its air. So that's one of the things that I'm considering. So would you have to, the wires will be exposed though, right? You wouldn't run it through the walls at that point. No, but what, what I can do is because of the bump out, I could, I could drill through the left side of that bump out and just okay. come out from behind the cabinet, shoot right through the wall and, and everything else I can get to kind of behind there. So where those where those speakers are to the left of the TV, right? That's that's all cavity behind there. So I I can drill through, pop the speaker out, and I've got this big open airspace. I can get I can get over to behind the TV. And actually, what I'm thinking about doing even further from that, because one of, one of the things that's been a real big challenge for the house is that I've got this living room set up that I wanted to keep real clean. I didn't want source components in the living room. I just wanted a TV and speakers you know, in wall stuff. And then now we've got the theater downstairs, but the rack is down there. So the, I've got a Den and AV uh, 1600 or X 1600H that, that drives those two speakers. And then the subs have TRIA dedicated amplifiers. That stuff's downstairs. So my signals kind of have, certain signals have to, if they're start, if they originate in the living room, they got to go down. If they originate downstairs, they got to come up. And I've got the channels and stuff to be able to route cables. And right now I've got like a 40 foot HDMI 2.1 fiber optic running between the rack and the TV for when the PC was downstairs. But I'm trying to arrive at a, at a state whereby I want to consolidate, especially if I stick with the PC over the consoles. I want to have one gaming PC and I want to be able to use it in the living room or I want to be and I want to be able to use it in the theater. So I've actually been tinkering with some things like Moonlight Streaming, which uses like the NVIDIA Game Stream. So if I leave the PC upstairs, I could run the Moonlight app on an Apple TV downstairs. And it, it works, but it, it has its challenges. So I'm thinking of even some more advanced stuff. Like if you get the right GPU, you can get two HDMI outputs on it, right? So I could run one of those HDMIs directly to the TV in the living room, take the other HDMI over that fiber optic down to the theater, and then just set up the PC for like dual monitor, like same screen output. And then I can go in either room, turn it on, and I'm good to go because everything's going to be 4K. And at least right now, again, I'm not using the 120 hertz and, and so on. Um, but if that comes comes in and the VRR updates and stuff come in, then I think I'm going to end up firmly gaming in the living room quite a bit more than the theater. Okay, fantastic. This is, you know, Jeremy, a question for you. I know somebody who is actually currently battling between selecting. Currently, he has a, a, a very. I think he has the same uh, Sony that you have, the eighty five er. Um, he's trying to decide large flat panel brightness or larger four K image, but not as bright. And it, it's a. It's, it's been a difficult decision for me. If you had to, if you had to pick one today that you had to live with for the duration of the time that you're in your house. Which would you go? Just, just display, not not considering the audio systems in both rooms, but just display wise. So, just, just to clarify, are you saying like big big flat screen versus a projection, or just flat screen versus a flat screen? Maybe better specs, but smaller size. Yeah. So yeah. So a flat panel and all of the benefits that come with that, 
versus a projector and all of benefits that come with that larger size, but dimmer image. Yeah. Um, all, you know, so yeah, yep. very interesting hearing your take on that. Yeah. So I, I've, I've gone back and forth between, between both going back to our very first house when we got married in 2000, I had a 92 inch screen projection set up in our living room. Um, and we used that until we moved out East and we had to go smaller and I went, went to flat panels. Um, I would, in a living room, a projector is tough and you're always going to be fighting light and, and ambient light and conditions and so on. Um, but I mean, if you're not getting up above like a hundred and at least say maybe 110 inches, I would go with the 85 inch flat panel. I, I just, the, the technology of the flat panels and if you're going to be gaming and stuff on it, again, buying into HDMI 2.1 for the new consoles or PC or whatever you might be playing off of the, the relative performance of that, the ease of setup installation, no bulb life, you know, to worry about or bulb replacements and that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I would definitely go um, until you cross a threshold, I would go large flat panel. Um, and I, I would draw that line somewhere around like a hundred, at least 110 inches. If you're not getting 20, 30 inches larger than the flat panel, then it's not worth the projector, in my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, to be honest with you, as I'm looking at your space, Jeremy, the one thing that I would keep in mind also, whether it's a projector or TV in a space like this, is the amount of light you have coming in. You have a lot of yep. windows here. Yeah. And yeah. I'm noticing yeah. that you don't have any coverings on those yep. windows either. Does that bother you sometimes when you're playing your games or you're watching your shows? With the flat panel, TV? no, not at all. We've kind of gotten used to it. <laughs> It's a running joke amongst all our friends and family that we've been in the house for like almost eight years and we have never hung curtains yet. Kind of been, we've been kind of been slow furnishing. And actually, it, it, the astute viewers might notice some differences in the furniture from some of the pictures to others. So we've been getting by for a long time on just this older couch. And uh, with, with COVID, though, if anybody wants to buy furniture, plan on it taking about six to eight months to get yeah. it. Because we, yeah. we bought furniture back in December, finally, for this room. So that corner chair... The, the coffee table and the bigger sectional. We bought those last year and we literally just got them a couple of weeks ago. So we're finally getting this room kind of structured out. I think someday we will have curtains um, someday, but, uh, yeah. but we, we live in kind of a quiet neighborhood and our house sits really, really, really tall. So there's not a lot of traffic and I've gotten over the feeling of like being exposed even at night. Cause there's really, there's nobody out in our neighborhood looking in and you really kind of have to look up you know, to see kind of into the house anyway. So we've just kind of gotten used to it. And I, I've actually, I, I actually like the no curtain element to it because during the day when you're not doing the AV stuff or whatever, it lets all that light in. It feels very open and airy, but, um, but it's fine. That, that Sony, it can stand up in the middle of the day. I can game just fine. Awesome. Well, all right. I think we pretty much covered a lot within this hour and a half or close to hour and a half. That we've been uh, talking about your theater. You've got a fantastic space, Jeremy, both Thank in the you. theater and your uh, living room. And um, I think a lot of people, as they watch this, those that are in the process of building and designing their theaters are really going to be able to take quite a bit away from what you shared today, or maybe give them some ideas to some challenges they may have been experiencing in their build. So we really appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and share this bit of information. My pleasure. So, Jeremy, if people want to follow you and some of the things that you're doing with your theater and maybe some other endeavors that you have going on, how can they go about doing so? Yeah, so I really don't have too much set up right now. My wife's been trying to push me for a long time. She's like, you need a YouTube channel. You tinker with all this stuff and, and messing with this and that. So I'm actually taking some steps forward to make that happen. So I've, I've, got, a, I've got a YouTube channel, the bones of it set up. Um, I think I'm going to call it tech enthusiasm. And my goal is to basically just talk about what I'm doing, right? Kind of similar, similar to what we've been talking about here. I might go back and, and cover some specific things, but like I said, I'm usually always moving something or, or upgrading something or buying this to try it. So I figure I might as well make some content around that. So my goal is to start maybe uploading some videos toward the end of June. I got to do a little more setup and get some things structured. Um, you know, in the meantime, if anybody did have any specific questions, I, I guess I could share, a, you know, Jeremy. Maybe, maybe your AVS forum, your AVS forum um, member name. Maybe they can reach you there. Yeah. So that's that's Jeremy P. Um, yeah. Feel free to message me there. I, I've been a, a member there quite a long time. And um, I'm also pretty frequent on the Kaleidoscape users forum as well. Um, tracks, tracks, Z, T-R-A-C-K-Z 
on uh, on Kaleidoscape. Yeah, I'll definitely see you on there. Yep. Now, Matt, if people want to follow you and some of the things that you've got going on, the hundred and one things that you're doing right now, <laughs> how can they go about following you? <laughs> oh, sure. Well, I'm on Instagram uh, at Brolic.media. Uh, YouTube and Facebook is uh, Brolic Space Media. And the website is www.blairhps.com. All right. I want to thank you all for listening into this episode. If you enjoyed what you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. We'd love for you to join in with us the next time. Tell your family, tell your friends. We want as many people to join in on the fun as possible. Be sure to leave us a review on your favorite podcast platforms so more people can find out what the fun waste of time is all about. If you're interested in some of the latest things that are happening within the Fun Waste of Time community, be sure to follow us on our website, thefunwasteoftime.com, Facebook, and Instagram. If you'd like to reach out to us to ask a question, share your thoughts on a particular subject, or just give us a shout out. You can contact us on the Fun Waste of Time website on our contact page, or shoot us an email at podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. That's podcast at thefunwasteoftime.com. Well, y'all take care. Y'all come back now. Yeah? <laughs>